Good evening. If you want to take your bulletin, we have some announcements to run through and some that are not in the bulletin. So let me just, let me begin. <clears throat> this one is in the bulletin. All right, there's a teen activity Friday night <clears throat> going to the Omaha Lancer hockey game. It'll be six, uh, <clears throat> six till 9.30 or 10. Um, cost on that is $14, so mom and dad, you are aware of that. Uh, Saturday morning, the fourth men's prayer meeting, um, and then the fifth, because when we're, those of you who are, and you know, participation's been down a little bit since we've gone back to this, we can talk about it. We're doing now the potluck and the afterglow on the first Sunday of the month, so it'll be December 5. Um, and then can, going forward next year, if we want to go back to later in the month, we can, we can talk about that. Uh, coming up on the 9th then is the Ladies' Christmas Fellowship, and I think that <clears throat> all the RSVPs are in on that. <clears throat> Um, December 11th is the uh, activity for the wrapping of the gifts for the adoptive family that is here at 1 p.m. Also, um, if you would be willing to <clears throat> um, deliver a package, uh, we have 17 families that we are sponsoring this year. Um, and so uh, if, you're in, if you'd be willing to help out delivering one, if you would just let Kelly know, drop, give her a note, drop her an email. Um, and right now, we're just, I'm just, you know, announcing if you do one, we'll see if we get 17 volunteers. Uh, otherwise, we may need to go up to a couple. But we, it's just really spread all over the city, so it's kind of hard, you know, to do a collective. Let's turn that into a collective outing. So, okay. <clears throat> um, come back. Okay, and you've, you've already seen they've, they've poured the new uh, driveway and, or the sidewalk. Whoa. Am I using this or this? I'm on the pulpit of the mic right now. Okay, fine. Just want to know. Um, anyway, so by Sunday you should have access to this entrance, but for right now it is closed. Um, and then going back to the bulletin, the evening of the 12th is when we will, pres we will officially vote on the 2022 budget. Uh, we will have that information to you as quickly um, as we can. <clears throat> and so, uh, Deacons, I, I sent you an email this week with some uh, numbers on it, some of the financial information. So if you get a chance to look at it before Sunday and get some feedback to me, we might have... Uh, something for you Sunday, certainly Wednesday at the latest. I realize that's a little bit uh, of a crunch, but but there's really nothing, you know, nothing significant changing in, in any of the budget numbers, so to whatever extent uh, that helps you. And then you are all invited on the 14th, uh, Tuesday night, to the Omaha Baptist Academy Christmas program uh, at 7 p.m., Okay, now let me see what else that I hit that I have here. Okay, uh, that's getting a little bit farther down the road. Okay, we've already talked to you about that. <clears throat> All right, and then just a couple things with reference to what Brother Dan mentioned. We have a youth activity planned uh, to the, for the teens to go down to the Open Door Mission, not as part of a public service, but kind of a help clean up and organize um, event. And they have asked us, you know, to kind of limit the number, which works good with the size of our youth department. But with that in mind, if any of you folks are interested in, in having an opportunity to work down at the Open Door Mission, if you would let Brother Dan know or let Rhonda Williams know, um, then we can plan something perhaps more on the adult side. Um, and that teen activity is Friday night, December 17th. And then one more thing that is not in your bulletin. Um, if, you have, if you saw Brother Bill Smith's last, uh, missionary letter. Um, he is right now in Africa, but he made mention of a missionary that he knows well in India who is in need of a car, and uh, we've kind of talked about it, the deacons and I have talked about it, and we're going to ask you to approve sending $10,000 uh, to help him with that car. Brother Smith thought, thought that the cost on a car would be somewhere between eight and 12000 
And of course, we asked him, you know, if he knew this man and could vouch for him, because we don't know the man, and he said, yes, he could. Um, if we proceed with that, and I had sent him an email, you know, had been talking to him about it email-wise, and just said, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know how the vote will go, but I don't anticipate there will be serious objections. Just so that you know from an accounting standpoint, right, if we, if you approve, and I think we're just going to ask you to approve it when we vote on the budget on the 12th, and we'll just do those votes um, at the same time. Um, we can't just write a check to $10,000 to the missionary in India. India is very much opposed to missionary, Christian missionary endeavors. They very much monitor those things. And so we're going to have to, it's going to have to go in smaller chunks, just so that, you know, when you look at the financial reports, it's just going to show up that way. So just for you to be aware of that. But, but it is our recommendation that we take $10,000 out of general fund and send it to this missionary in India uh, to help him with his expenses. All right, I think that I have covered all of the announcement bases. If you will stand, we will pray. <clears throat> No, we'll send it out of general fund, I think, Paul. I think we'll send it out. I, I guess we can talk about that, <clears throat> but my assumption was that we were going to just send it out of general fund. There is money in missions fund, um, so we could do it there, but I just assumed we'd send it out of general fund. That's, that's where most of the money is uh, these days. All right, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your sovereign grace and your kind salvation and Father, we rejoice that you are the master of all things and that, although it certainly doesn't look like it at times, the, the final victory is assured and certain and you will triumph and conquer all to your, to your glory and to the praise of that glory. And we pray then your blessing upon the life of our church and the lives of all of your people, wherever they might be. And we pray that you would help us in our public services to know you as we come to understand your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Skip was supposed to lead tonight, but he wasn't able to make it. So I asked him what songs, and he said, here comes Santa Claus. So can you play that? Okay. Uh, hymn number one, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses. Turn forward a few pages to hymn 223. We'll sing all four verses of Born to Die, hymn 223. the 
Well, Revelation chapter 11 tonight, please. Revelation chapter number 11. And our passage this evening is verses 15 through 19. <clears throat> and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. And let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, please help us tonight to have good understanding about what we are being taught, what you are explaining to us. Help us to be greatly comforted by what we read this evening that our voices would be added to the voices of these, your elders, who rejoice at your triumphant victory. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a lot of exciting material yet to come in the book of Revelation. But the climax of the book we have just read. It is, right, the book begins by telling us that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly, quickly come to pass. And this is the culmination of that revelation that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his anointed of his Christ, of his Messiah. Sequentially, and we will, you know, the the book will take a bit of a change now. We, We have been proceeding, I have been arguing, and we will continue to, to some extent, move through the events of Revelation in some sort of sequence. In other words, we've talked about, and I have personally rejected and not taught it to you as factual, that there is a cycle to this, that the, that, the, that the seals and the trumpets and the judgments are just repetition with varying pieces of information of the same events, but that there is a sequence to them. And so we have worked our way chronologically through the seals. The seals have given way to the trumpets, and in the trumpets there are woes, And this is our key. This is our cue to where we are in verse number 15, the seventh angel sounded. We will see this when we move a little farther into the book of Revelation. But we should be able to build this off of the fact that we've read the first 14 verses, which place us right at just about the middle point of the seven-year tribulation. There are 42 months remaining. And in those last 42 months, God will very quickly pour out the last of his judgments upon the earth and its inhabitants. But before he gets to that point, right, before he returns to that immediate, this is what's going on in the tribulation, he is going to take us back in time. And he is going to explain to us that this is a conflict that is not new and that his great wrath is not unprovoked, but that this has been building through the ages and through the centuries, and we will ultimately get to that. Right? So, right, Revelation 11, 14, the second woe is passed, the third is on his way, and Revelation 11, 15, the seventh angel sounds. The exact nature and the specific event of the third woe is never expressly stated, but verse number 15 certainly conveys the meaning of it and the context and the sentiment. Even the Old Testament tells us that when Jesus Christ appears, the world will mourn. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. We are approaching that holiday season when foolish people, right? Wise people celebrate the advent of Christ, understanding what it means. Foolish people celebrate the advent of Christ, not comprehending what it means. It means the end for those who do not believe. This is what their end will be. I want to take the passage tonight and deal with it, not necessarily sequentially, but thematically. There are three main points that are being made in these verses, which again, I would argue are the literary climax of the book, specifically verse number 15, 
The seventh angel sounded. There were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The first point that is being made, the theme of verse number 15, is the triumph of God. This is the ultimate triumph of God. <clears throat> In Revelation 10.6, God's mighty angel made the declaration. Our King James Bible says that there should be time no longer. But what he, what he means is time's up. Time is up. There will be time no longer. We're, there's no more going to be a delay. We are going to bring this thing to a quick conclusion. And in verse number 15, then, right, we see that conclusion. Verse number 15, I mean, the whole passage we're dealing with in three points, but there are three different things going on in verse number 15. There is an announcement by great voices, unidentified voices, perhaps the entirety of the heavenly host making their proclamation. There is accomplishment. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Now we have in Sunday school now for a lengthy period of time, folks, been talking about the kingdom. And there are lots of views about what the kingdom is and whether it's really a kingdom, a literal kingdom, a, a material kingdom, or whether it's just the reign of Christ in a general way or whether it's the reign of Christ in our hearts. But the text of Scripture in verse number 15 seems to be pretty clear, as most of the texts of Scripture are on this matter. Right? That the kingdoms of the earth belong to God. And that from the beginning of the creation, it has been His intention that people function as His vassals, that they wield their authority as humans under His authority, and they pay homage to Him, and they honor Him. That has not happened. But it will happen. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And that brings us to the third thing that we see in verse number 15. There is the announcement of his victory. There is the accomplishment of his victory. And there is the activity of his victory. He shall reign. He shall reign. <clears throat> We've all heard of St. Peter's Basilica. That's where we get the word right there, reign. He shall wield the power of a king eon towards eon forever and ever. Eon towards eon. And again, folks, this is not only the theme of the book of Revelation. This is the theme of the Bible. This is what God has been saying from the very beginning of the text of Scripture that he reigns, and there is a sense in which all of human history has been either the embracing of or the rejection of his reign, and what it looks like when people willingly accept his reign, and what it looks like when people <clears throat> no longer or will not submit to his reign. <clears throat> There's an author, and I would recommend, I wouldn't recommend all of his books because not all of them are equally good, but I just find this kind of stuff fascinating. I've mentioned him, I think, before. His name is Theodore Dalrymple. He is a British psychiatrist who spent the vast majority of his career working in London prisons. And he has a fascinating insight into human nature. He is an unbeliever. He would tell you he's an unbeliever. He has a fascinating insight into human nature. And in one of his books, he has a chapter about the new atheism. <clears throat> and he makes reference to a British atheist, a parliamentarian, who every time he went into a public meeting, pulled out his pocket watch and gave God 60 seconds to kill him. And then the unbeliever Theodore Dalrymple made this observation. <clears throat> God bided his time, but got him in the end. And this is what happens to all unbelievers. God will bide his time, but he gets them in the end. And that's what we have here, folks. This, this has been the testimony of Scripture from the very beginning. It has been contested on earth from the very beginning. Nimrod began to build a kingdom. 
right? And he was in the face of the Lord. This is what is said about Ishmael, right? He will live in the face of. He will be in opposition to. This is the question raised by the psalmist in Psalm number 2. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? This wild, unicorn-like fantasy that they can cut themselves apart from God and His existence and His precepts and His authority and live as they wish. This is, the, this is what is being discussed in Daniel chapter 2 when Daniel sees his vision of great kingdoms arising and then seemingly out of nowhere with great power and force comes a stone cut out without hands and smashes every kingdom. Then comes Daniel 4 where Nebuchadnezzar spends seven years living on his hands and knees like a wild animal, so that he might learn this lesson that the Lord God rules in from heaven in the affairs of men and does whatever he wants. This is nothing new, folks. This is the texture, the text of Scripture. This is what it always presents. This is what it always demands. This is why it demands it of us. God reigns. I will not have his reign. Then you will suffer the consequences. God reigns. I will decide for myself what the reign of God looks like, and you will suffer the consequences. No human is exempt from this. No collection of humans is exempt from this. This is the theme of Jesus' preaching. <clears throat> the kingdom is here. Of course the kingdom is here. The king is here. And yet, the king was rejected and crucified. And to quote Theodore Dalrymple, God bided his time. Revelation 10.6, time's up. Time is up. And by the way, this is the hope of the saints. This is what the preacher in Hebrews will plead with us to recall at the end of his letter. We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. We are getting a kingdom that cannot be moved. Don't forget <clears throat> that. And this is God's message to His believing saints. Live like kingdom citizens. Live like people who are going to see the fulfillment of God's promises. This is what we are commanded to pray, that His kingdom would come. And here it is, folks, Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That is the first dimension of the passage. Secondly, <clears throat> verses 16, 17, and 18, there is the testimony of God's saints. What should the proper response be to the proclamation of 1115? The unbelieving world will mourn and will grieve and will wail at the prospect. But not the saints, folks. Not the saints. Verse number 16, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats, literally thrones, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. In chapter 4 and 5, we met these elders for the first time. We talked about them. They're almost certainly representatives of humanity, why there are 24, we don't know. We can speculate forever. But they are very human-like in their aspect, folks. They sit on thrones and they wear crowns. These are things that are promised to us. God promises humanity that faithful service will result in crowns and thrones. 
So they're almost certainly representative humanity. Elder is a word, quite honestly, that's a little confusing to us because it can represent either a rank or an age. In other words, when you get old, you become an elder. Or you can have the office of an elder. It can be a rank or it can just be a a description of respect. And we don't know how it's being used here. We do know this, folks, right? As, As unpalatable as it might be to the American ear, that God's plan for leadership in the earth is mature male leadership. Always. Whether it be a home, whether it be a workplace, whether it be a church, mature male leadership is God's will. Elders. Elders. The rule of those with experience. No other creature is mentioned here. The angels might make up part of the voices of verse number 15. The living beasts, in a good sense, the living creatures that surround the throne and worship God might be part of verse number 15. But we are told specifically only of those in verse number 16 who are elders, and these elders depart from their thrones and fall on their faces in an act of physical worship. They literally kiss the hand. They kiss the hand. And they praise God. We give to you, God, thanks, verse number 17. Because you have finally and at long last taken this to yourself. And what will happen, folks, when we get into chapter 12 and chapter 13, we will see the time and the process by which God does, in fact, take this to himself. Actually, we'll continue all the way into chapter 17. God will take to himself this power. He will take it away from kings. He will take it away from demons. He will take it away from Satan. And they testify then in verse number 18 to God's sovereign strength and the certainty of his word. The nations were angry. The nations have always been angry. Virtually every nation that you encounter in the Scriptures, folks, is hostile to God. And the only one that's not supposed to be is Israel, and frequently Israel is hostile to God. The nations were angry. The collective proclamation of humanity is, we will not have this man to rule over us. But your wrath has come. And I'm not getting into a fight with the text of Scripture there with the King James, but the word, the conjunction there, and, can also carry the force of but. And I think that perhaps that's the way we should read it. The nations were angry, but thy wrath has come. The collective anger of the nations is completely insignificant in the face of God's anger. Unfazed by human anger, untouched by human anger, unswayed by human anger. The nations were angry, but God's anger has come. He has, folks, been, I mean, right, the the word that is used in in the book of Romans, treasurous, is the word thesaurus, a collection. God has been Right? Human, what, what happens with humanity is, right? We, we do something sinful. We say something sinful. We commit something sinful. And over the course of time, right, because we are finite sinful beings, we forget about it or we minimize it or we explain it away as if it is inconsequential or we get over it. And it loses much of its force to us, but it loses nothing to God. Adam's sin, in a sense, is as fresh to God as the day in which it was committed. Just stockpiles it. And it will will be addressed by the blood of Christ or it will be addressed by the individual that committed it, but it will not go away. It will not just evaporate 
by virtue of the calendar. Because God's wrath has come, it is the time of the judgment of the dead, which certainly means both the spiritually dead and the physically dead. And we will see that reunion of dead spirits with dead bodies later in the book. But because the time is up and because the kingdom has come, then this is also the time to reward faithful servants. And they are listed there, right? What a, what a comfort and encouragement. Thy servants, the prophets. Well, of course, they should be rewarded. They're prophets. <clears throat> they, they have written scripture and stood against the evils of a whole society. And the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. Right? Jesus explained to us that we would not lose the reward for even a cup of cold water. God is faithful in his rewards. And then in verse number 18, he will destroy them that destroy the earth. And, and this, quite honestly, folks, if it was not so eternally sad, would almost be laughable. Not the Bible being laughable. But if you think about its counterpart in the world and the mass um, and the amounts of money and language and legislation that is given to the name of saving the world. And if we ask the Lord, are they saving the world? God would say, unbelieving people are destroying the world. Unbelieving people are the cause of the destruction. They're the ones destroying the world. And they will be dealt with. Evil people are what is wrong Evil people will be addressed. So there is the triumph of God. <clears throat> there is the testimony of the saints. Verses 16 to 18, folks, are a pattern for us how to think and how to respond. Right? We pray for God's kingdom to come. We anticipate God's kingdom. Here is the proper response. Glorious celebration, recognition of God's righteousness, even to the place of judgment. And that brings us then verse number 19, the temple of God in heaven. The temple of God in heaven. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Well this is obviously the real temple. And by that I mean the earthly temples that we have seen are not the real temple. Hebrews 8.1 tells us this, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And then of the earthly temple, he says in 8.5, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. This is the real temple. And this temple is opened. And we are not told what the nature of the doorway is, but the temple is opened. Now, let me call upon your Bible knowledge. <clears throat> let's, go back to the, <clears throat> let's go back to the tabernacle of Moses. If you could peer into the temple, what, the tabernacle, what are you going to see? Right, well, there's, there's going to be a table with showbread. And there's going to be a golden lampstand. There's going to be several items of furniture that would first catch our eye. But what we see in this temple, God calls our attention to one piece of furniture. And I'm going to use the Old Testament language because it's the language that we would be the most familiar with. The temple of God was open in heaven and there was seen in the temple the Ark of His Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. 
So not the table of showbread, not the altar of incense, which we've really already talked about, right? Because we've already dealt with incense in the book of Revelation. Not the golden lampstand, but the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the truth is that we do not know why only this piece of furniture is mentioned. There's no explanation given. But I would propose to you, this would be the way that I would be comfortable thinking about it, right? That the operative word, folks, is the word covenant, testament. Right? Where are we in the book of Revelation? That which God has promised to his people from the very beginning, kingdom. Right? We're getting ready. I mean, we're not getting ready immediately, but we're going to reach the place in the book of Revelation, in the book of Hebrews, where we read about all of these faithful people who died and their common denominators is they didn't receive the promise. They didn't receive the promise. And there's a very good chance, folks, right? I mean, we could be raptured out of here, but if that doesn't happen, we're going to die without having received the promise. There's the promise of the kingdom. Right? So what do we see? <clears throat> we see the Ark of the Covenant. We see God, in effect, saying, see, I keep my word. I promised it. I keep my word. Not on your calendar, but it's never been about your calendar. It's always been about my calendar. <clears throat> and then there is all kinds of, not supernatural, but activity that is, again, echoing the Old Testament manifestation of God. Right? When, when people came into the presence of God, there were usually these kinds of symbols and signs that went with it. Lightning and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. As if the very presence of God moves the earth. So that's where, we, that's where we are this evening. And we really with this have reached the literary climax of the book. Like I said, there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff coming. But, but it is all built off of this idea that God's wrath has come. He is taking his power. He is claiming his rightful authority over earth. And we get to see how it happens. All right, so we're going to stop there. If you want to take your, uh, your prayer bulletin... <clears throat> Uh, the only thing that I have for an update, and I know that some of you know this, but uh, Jeff and Josie are expecting a little girl, and they found out that she has a hole in her heart. The doctor says that he thinks everything, you know, he fully expects everything to be okay. But there will be surgery, and depending upon how bad it is, that there will either be open-heart surgery very early in her life or somewhere around the age, kindergarten age. So just please pray for the baby and for everybody that's, you know, mom and dad and all the, the, the relatives that are attendant there. And then is there anything else that you need to add or update with reference to the prayer list? No? All right, let's go together to the Lord this evening. Well, Father, we add our prayers to the prayers of so many of your saints that your kingdom would come, that it would come quickly. And that you, Jesus Christ, would come quickly. And we pray, Father, that we would be faithful to you and mindful always of you until that time. This is what is our instruction, to always be ready, to always be anticipating, to live like kingdom citizens. And so we pray that your will in that area would be done. And we pray, Lord, for baby McCurdy, that you would give her immediate healing right now and give grace to the family and we pray that all these things would be done to your glory. And we thank you for the comfort that we have through our Savior and your Spirit. And pray that not just for the McCurdy's, but for all of us, Lord, that we would minister to each other and be faithful to you in the discharge of that duty. We pray that we would love you and serve you faithfully. We pray that we would resist the devil. We pray that your will would be done in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for being here this evening. God bless you and good night.